Hi, everyone, and welcome to Wholesale Change, the webcast and podcast from Distribution Strategy Group, where we provide thought leadership for wholesale change agents like you, because if you're on this webcast or podcast, you probably are a wholesale change agent. My name is Ian Heller. I'll be your co-host today, along with my business partner, the Lion of Logic, the Doctor of Distribution, my business partner, Jonathan Bine, PhD. Jonathan, Logic, how are you today? Logic never lies. You live long and prosper. Sell more and prosper. Okay. Right? Yeah. And we all have a special guest today. I'd like to welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Darren Rossin, a longtime friend of mine and a colleague uh, a couple of times and currently the president of AZ Parts Master. How are you today, Darren? Doing great, Ian. Great to see you. Good. Great to see you too. Thanks for joining us. So if you have a question, please click on the Q&A button uh, somewhere on your screen there and submit it. We, we try to get to all the questions that we can so that we can make the show as interactive as possible. Before we jump into the content, I want to thank Epicor, who is our new sponsor. Thank you, Epicor. The show is brought to you by them. Epicor Software Corporation drives business growth. They provide flexible industry-specific software designed to fit the precise needs of their manufacturing, distribution, retail, and service industry customers. More than 45 years of experience with their customers' unique business processes and operational requirements are built into every solution, in the cloud or on-premises. With this deep understanding of your industry, Epicor Solutions dramatically improve performance and profitability while easing complexity so you can focus on growth. For more information, visit the URL on the screen. That's epicor.com slash distribution, epicor.com slash distribution. And we did not know this until we talked to you yesterday to prep for the show, Darren, but you're an Epicor customer, right? Yeah, absolutely. We uh, operate on the Profit 21 platform and are extremely satisfied. It's a really uh, a capable system that's driving a lot of value that we didn't even anticipate. So Fantastic. Great. We will go back to Epicorn and raise our rates. <laughs> no, glad to know that. We, we didn't know that it was not planned. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Darren Ross. And so, uh, as I said, we'll have you talk a little bit about AZ Parts Master today, Darren, but you've been in the multifamily industry for a long time. As a consultant, uh, you were with, uh, you were the president of Stern Electronics, which is a manufacturer, I believe. Uh, you were at HD Supply just before I got there, probably left just in time from your perspective. Um, in the multifamily side of the business. Uh, and uh, we actually overlapped for several years at Granger, right? So that's where really where we met, I think back in 1992. So, you know, we've worked together for a long time. Um, we're glad to have you here. And the reason that you're on the show is that uh, when Home Depot bought HD Supply, I wrote a column about that acquisition. And I had two main points. One was that... Uh, it was a really good valuation and that Joe D'Angelo should be congratulated for selling at such a price because we thought it was a you know, great deal for them. And the second one was, it was probably good that he sold because companies like HD Supply were probably going to get squeezed between what Lowe's is doing and Home Depot is doing and what Amazon business is doing in multifamily. And that's the part that you took issue with, um, which is cool. And I love when, when people reach out like that. And we, you know, we, the penalty is you get to be on the show. Yeah. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do at AZ Parts Master, about the company, and then we'll jump into the debate about whether this transaction squeezes out other players or if there's still plenty of room for growth, which I think is your point of view. No, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, always be a troublemaker if I if I can help out. <laughs> anyway, um, AZ Parts Master, phenomenal company, right? Thirty five year old company, um, about sixty five million in revenues this year, projecting about one hundred million in revenues next year. Uh, I watched this company almost a decade ago when I was at HD Supply as a potential acquisition target, running mergers and acquisitions for HD Supply. And at the time, and I've shared this with ownership, uh, Brad Schlecht, who's uh, our CEO and has uh, spent his entire career working for a company that his dad founded. Uh, great family history, great legacy. Uh, I shared with Brad that at the time we decided not to pursue an acquisition because we thought the company uh, was small enough that we could push them out of the marketplace over time and that HC Supply's value proposition would win. Uh, the company's doubled in size since that point in time. And uh, as I shared, we're probably looking at double in size again in the next year or so. Uh, I joined the company in January after uh, a long uh, series of meetings with Brad talking about what the opportunities were in the industry and, and where I really felt uh, a company like AZP could be the best value provider in the marketplace and, um, 
and take market share from the big competitors. And I anticipated actually that some transaction might happen with, uh, with HD supply and I said that's going to provide an amazing opportunity for companies like AZP to grow and add value to the customers that we serve in the market. I joined in January. Uh, we were on a 20% growth rate until March when COVID hit and changed everyone's world, ours included. Uh, but we've had a great, we had a great 2020. We had a lot of accomplishments as a company and it helped us really fine tune what we're gonna be doing going forward. Good, and you're anticipating, I don't know how much you can talk about, but you're anticipating a good 2021? Yeah, you know, we're, we're still cautious about the first quarter. Uh, we feel that our customer markets, our supplier markets and our own business have really understood operating kind of running rules with COVID as it is today. We suspect it's gonna probably have to continue this way for 90 to 120 days. Um, but the industry, you know, we, as many distributors in the MRO space, regardless of market, uh, maintenance can only be deferred. It cannot be eliminated. Um, our industry has deferred a tremendous amount of uh, maintenance as well as renovation. And we really look forward to that picking up pretty aggressively in 2021. Now, uh, a lot of the revenue for multifamily distributors comes when people move in and out of apartments, right? And that's been artificially depressed right now because, uh, I mean, you know, sort of not to uh, make value judgments here, but people are going to get evicted more pretty soon, right? And th that's a sad thing, but it's a real thing. And it's going to require maintenance to get those apartments back into shape, those multifamily properties back into shape. Um, but you also have some views about how all of this and in, in lifestyle changes are going to affect the size of the multifamily market too, right? I mean, and you, you think they're, I think the last time we talked, you, you thought that potentially some hospitality properties may can get converted to multifamily because traditionally hospitality was a higher uh, uh, revenue per square foot, but that's not necessarily true going forward. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I'll hit that last. I think most importantly, the multifamily market is an incredibly attractive market to be a, a service provider or a product uh, seller distributor to. It's, uh, it, it performs well in downturns. It performs well in upturns. Uh, I think COVID and some generational transitions are making uh, America a renter nation. So uh, this market has nothing but upside in terms of its potential for growth. Uh, it is transforming in terms of the uh, environments that people are living in where renting used to be a decision based on socioeconomic need. It's now a decision based on uh, uh, choice. So uh, people at any income level at any uh, stage in life are choosing renting because of the amenities, because of the um, lack of responsibility or accountability to maintain a property. Um, it's just easier. And because of that, we know our customers continue to invest in the market uh, with uh, either new construction and particularly renovation of properties or value add uh, improvements to properties. Those things are, are big drivers for spend. As you mentioned, turns are a huge driver for MRO spend. Uh, and that was depressed this year. We anticipate people will start moving again. And we think COVID drives uh, an expansion of the, the need from a renter, meaning historically where you would spend eight to 12 hours at, at your rented property, you may spend 24 hours a day in your property today. And you may need extra space, whether that's an office space or a second bedroom, third bedroom to, to convert to office space. So we're uh, very bullish. We, we are exclusively focused on multifamily. Uh, the last piece hasn't come to fruition as much as we anticipated. I think that's more based on government code uh, issues, but we do expect some conversion of the hospitality space to multifamily uh, hospitality is going to have certain sectors of that market that just won't return in the way that they they yeah. have been. Well, they don't really need to not return. They just need to not present as good a profit as a multifamily property would, right? And yep. and and so the the equation changes somewhat. Now, do you think that this optimism that you have about the multifamily market is what's drawing or is shared by Home Depot and Lowe's and others who are joining the the fray here? Is that what's driving it? As they see the opp same opportunity you do? Uh, great question. So uh, I think Lowe's and Home Depot view the world somewhat differently. Lowe's, uh, Lowe's felt like they were late to the party uh, in terms of supporting the professional uh, B2B buyer, whether that's contractor or uh, multifamily or any other number of uh, B2B, uh, B2B MRO buyers. So I think their acquisition in the space of the maintenance supply headquarters was probably a, a reaction to Home Depot being in the space and having acquired multiple times in the space. 
Uh, Home Depot is much more strategic and, and uh, I think thoughtful about it. They, uh, they very intentionally uh, were in the space. I think they recognized um, that it was probably a mistake to divest of the HD supply uh, FM business, at least in the, in the beginning. And the opportunity to get it back was, uh, was something worth paying a premium for. And, and to your point earlier, I, I think uh, kudos to Joe D'Angelo and the management team at HD supply. They, uh, they run a really uh, efficient, exceptional hot company, and they got a return for that um, in the acquisition. I think Home Depot sees this as a platform to grow into other markets and probably to support their greater B2B initiative. As you and I discussed yesterday, I think um, you know, HD Supply is already, or sorry, Home Depot in their HD Pro business is already probably a 40, 50, 60 billion dollar player. Yeah, we think we think 60, by the way. And, and this arguably is a rounding error, right? And then you round it down a little bit more the multifamily business is, you know, for HD Supply, uh, I would say that's probably a $3 billion, uh, you know, 2 to $3 billion piece of their business. And for the former Interline or Wilmar business, it's probably only about a $500 million to $700 million piece of business. So, which then, Home Depot also owns. Which is why but, it, but it's not a rounding error in terms of, in terms of capability. It is a, no. Right? Uh, absolutely. And it's one of the, one of the things that I think... Uh, Home Depot saw the opportunity to acquire HC supplies because of the, a combination of the management talent, uh, the you know, kind of depth of understanding and experience in these uh, numerous B2B uh, residential uh, MRO environments and, uh, and because of some of the service capabilities and execution capabilities they have. So what, what, so you think that they bought them not only, you know, because financially it was accretive to their bottom line, right? And it's such a minor way to your point because it's kind of around the year that it's not going to affect their earnings estimate. Uh, but it was not like, you know, I mean, I had a finance prof in graduate school who said when they call it a strategic deal, it means they can't make the numbers work. Okay. <laughs> and, but in this case it was, it was accretive. So they could make the numbers work. Uh, but there's this sense that they are acquiring capabilities that they think they can leverage. That's what you told us yesterday. Right. So it wasn't just to get the business. So what are they going to do with these assets? Do you think that's going to allow them to get a bigger return than even the, the financial return? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I had the privilege of uh, participating in the M and a activities in the team for home Depot in the past. And what I know of their, uh, of their organization, their approach, they're an, an exceptionally talented group. They don't do things without having clear financial justification of why they're making an acquisition like that. So um, I, I'm certain they went through that same process. And, and I know the HD supply team on the, on the opposite side has the same jobs. So the, the options in terms of where they see that, right? So I don't, I don't have insight to the board perspective on this, but sure. uh, I would venture to say um, Home Depot sees the competencies, capabilities, and the platform uh, particularly a delivery platform, a fulfillment platform, um, a warehouse-based distribution business rather than a retail store-based distribution business um, that can serve and support a broad uh, array of B2B customers in a highly transactional uh, pseudo-residential slash construction type of environment, right? It, it extends the range from uh, construction trades uh, through maintenance uh, and repair trades. And uh, that will give them the opportunity to serve and support uh, customers beyond multifamily, hospitality, and healthcare. Yes, I always wondered why uh, Home Depot and Lowe's didn't pursue the white cat business instead of the MRO business. And if it seems more adjacent, right? I mean, you could take care, you have, there's certainly more overlap in the products that you sell. And that, you know, adjacency to the job site matters. You can't serve job sites out of big distribution centers that are hundreds of miles away, right? You've got to, you, you got to be close enough to deliver on flatbed trucks. Um, and the only thing I could think of was they wanted to diversify their revenues and then, and not buy into the cyclicality of construction further. I mean, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I would think probably twofold. One, we, we didn't see, uh, that deal was pretty quiet as was the HG supply deal. I mean, in fact, yeah. the, the, um, uh, unfortunate and, uh, perhaps incorrect announcement that Lowe's was acquiring, uh, right. HG by, you know, a few days before the announcement came out that HD was uh, acquiring HD supply uh, tells us that they ran a really tight deal. I think the white cap deal may have, uh, the value may have been higher for a private equity buyer. You know, we know the buyers there, they're really good buyers. Uh, yeah. May have been a, a better deal for them to buy it than for 
Home Depot. And the other thought is that uh, my sense is that Home Depot sees that they can probably access that market with their core competencies existing internally. And I'm not sure that they have the ability to jump to the full B2B MRO renovation market as easily without acquisition. So if you look at what they've added on in terms of assets and resources, they've got a big sales force or bigger one than they had before by far. They've yep. got um, distribution centers chock full of MRO supplies that they didn't have before, but they're in the middle of this $150 million um, uh, expansion of their distribution network anyway. So they're going to have to rationalize those two. Those two. They, there's a, by the way, there's a good Goldman Sachs um, lunchtime conference call that's public. You have to register for it, but it's between um, the CEO of Home Depot and the EVP, I think it's branch operations. Um, and a Goldman Sachs analyst, and they go through a lot of this stuff. It's very interesting. You can get it for free on goldmansachs.com. Um, and so they get the sales force, they get the distribution center, and they get the delivery fleet. Are those important parts of that deal? Are they going to turn around and le- you know, try to leverage those in a bigger way? Or do you think they're going to fold some of that stuff into their current operations in, in, in a, you know, remove the redundancy way? <laughs> I mean, how are they going to approach this? I, I- so I, I like the question because it plays into why I feel so bullish about the growth opportunities for AZP. Right. Um, I think that Home Depot and Lowe's and, and now uh, we haven't brought them up, but I'll add them to the conversation, Amazon. Mm. Uh, Home Depot and Lowe's are responding to the threat from Amazon. Uh, they're trying to understand what their ability to get as proximate to their customers. How can they get to as proximate to their customers to prevent disintermediation from a digital only competitor. <clears throat> These are uh, really important strategic efforts that a company like a Home Depot or Lowe's have to perform. In the process of doing that, I think they look at the strategic implications of having a footprint and drivers and the ability to fulfill product to the customers that they wanna serve. Uh, what they're not contemplating in that, and, and we'll play into this very aggressively, my field sales team knows some of this messaging and we'll carry this message pretty aggressively now that the acquisitions done is that the multifamily customer in this space is a very specific um, service, high service expectation uh, type of customer. And they're relatively insignificant in the direction of where Home Depot or Lowe's may need to go strategically to defeat or to compete with Amazon in a big picture. Uh, On the contrary, AZP is exclusively focused on multifamily. That customer segment is significantly large for us and a great growth opportunity. And we believe that some of the implications of the integration, which is never easy, uh, even with highly capable and competent teams that Home Depot and HC Supply have, sure. will cause challenges in the marketplace and some defection. And that defection, even at a nominal level, could throw tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars into the marketplace for other suppliers to compete for. That's an interesting perspective. So disrupt, or uh, there's always disruption associated with uh, acquisition and integration. So you're going to get some defection no matter what, because you can't do it perfectly, right? And so you want to be positioned to pick up some of that. Uh, that's interesting. What do you see as the role of the account manager going forward, Darren? I mean, this is, you know, there's the, there was a the famous article, Death of a Salesman, several years ago, um, and uh, uh, it, which is, and he didn't state that like, well, they're all going away. He talked about, you know, be, the need to be more value added. So uh, but what do you, that's Annie Hoare, uh, uh, who, who wrote that article, who I have a lot of, lot of respect for. Um, but there is this notion that the role of the sales rep is going to need to change or at least take a different form in some industries than others. What's it going to look like in the multifamily industry? Yeah, uh, great question. So uh, this is an industry that uh, it, it, the dynamics of the industry, right? There's roughly 22 to 25 million apartment units in the United States. It's consistently growing, as we mentioned earlier, and the value of these uh, environments has increased, right? So the investor in this environment is looking for a net operating income, and they're looking at an increase in the value of their asset over time. So from their perspective, things that do those things for them are really important. So tying the service value proposition to the metrics that your customer uses is the most important thing you can do. Uh, my belief is that uh, the field sales organization has been the heart and soul of the companies that have served and supported this industry for decades. And although I do see some transformation in that role of responsibility, I am 100% confident that that is one of the key differentiators that AZP will continue to invest in 
uh, not just more salespeople to support our customers, but uh, more tools that support our salespeople to demonstrate and document and deliver value to those customers. I think the uh, key differ differentiator, right, as we look at our now our, uh, I call them the apron strings, right, but our, our retail competitors um, are really driving towards efficiency with their sales organization rather than value add. So how many calls can you make? Uh, can you force compliance? Can you review reports on, on what your spend is? Uh, very transactionally focused, where as our intention is to get deeper, more intimate with our customer and do more things for them. This industry at a, at a property level uh, is uh, very lean on resources. They're very lean on inventory. Um, and it's uh, still transforming into a technologically um, engaged organizations, right? So at the, at the maintenance supervisor level, it is still uh, not the most sophisticated technology users. And fortunately, new technology solutions are now much easier to use than they were historically. And, and mobile empowered or mobile uh, engaged makes them really uh, appropriate for a maintenance staff that's probably never had a computer anymore. Interesting. Okay. So, I, I mean, you know, I told you this yesterday. I think you agree. This notion that, well, there's no more room for the professional visitor who delivers donuts. Well, I never, <laughs> that was never a successful sales rep, right? I mean, in my experience with account managers going back to the 80s, good, great account managers add value on sales calls. And the ones who were just delivering donuts and shaking hands didn't last long. So, I think that whole notion that there used to be this useless sales role out there. Um, you know, this glad handing, and that was somehow a sales model. That's not really ever been true in my experience. Uh, but going forward, I do think they're going to need to add more value, right? And so if you look at sort of, you know, the relationship, which I would say is not just familiarity and affection or whatever, it's also, hey, you really understand me because we've been working together for a long time and I trust you, which is a huge thing in B2B. Yep. Yep. So that's the relationship side. And then the value added side is, hey, you're understanding their business processes or you're figuring out new ways to deliver value. Maybe it's energy audits or safety audits or helping them consolidate POs or automate their purchases or whatever. You know, if you look at sort of that relationship side, which is trust, familiarity, and the value added side, which is being able to do things that demonstrably reduce costs or improve the economic conditions or productivity or whatever, economic outcomes or productivity of this, of this customer, is that, is that Pendle or is that teeter totter going to swing more towards the value add over time? Yeah, it absolutely has to. Um, and we'll use technology to deploy more, you know, more value that historically used to be uh, closer to the donuts kind of uh, activities. The, uh, you know, the unique thing with this industry, right? So uh, properties don't move, uh, but they change hands frequently, right? So the nature of the property stays the same, but uh, we often see new management teams transition or new expectations come along. One of the key things that I think our sales organization is extremely competent and capable of doing is helping the property managers understand what has historically happened at their property. We as a company are really developing uh, you know, a data lakes to analyze information about a property so that anytime that change may happen, uh, we can demonstrate our value just knowing what has historically happened to that property, which may not have transitioned from the former owner or operator. Um, you know, additionally, we have the uh, advantage of working with you know, thousands of customers and thousands of properties where we can find best demonstrated practices and share those with our customers. So where there's not necessarily an alignment for how a, um, a company who's sitting, property sitting right next door to a direct competitor, uh, they clearly in the leasing office will fight day in and day out to get that next resident. But in the maintenance office, uh, they don't have the opportunity to talk to each other to figure out what each of them are doing uh, better than the other. And we're, we're the bridge for that. Uh, and we're systematizing at AZP, we're systematizing some of that um, tribal knowledge to again, get deeper and more intimate with our customer in this environment. So you mentioned these data lakes, data that, so, so I think there's an important point you went over quickly, which is that sometimes data about the property, and I'm talking about, you know, the products that are in each unit, doesn't necessarily pass in a documented fashion from one owner to the next, right? So if you sell a multifamily unit, you, somewhere in your purchasing history, maybe the records about, you know, every uh, fan, toilet, faucet, 
light bulb in every unit, but it's not been organized in any way. And so if something happens in a, if you need to renovate an apartment, someone's got to go in and do an inventory of all that stuff or something goes wrong, they have to go out and figure out what it is, even if it's not marked. Yeah. And I think what you, what I'm hearing you say is you're going to have an archive of all that information that you can bring to add value to the customer. It's one of the initiatives that we're working on today. We, we realize, particularly for properties we've been serving for years, if not decades, uh, we have better information than any owner, uh, any new owner particularly may have on the property. Uh, and that's true of distribution in general. Right? I think distribution uh, tends to be one of the uh, least effective or efficient um, analysts of the data that we have. We're, we're, a, we're a data rich industry. Uh, we're transactionally rich, we're skew information um, rich timing and such. And, and it's important that uh, any company that's in this space really invest in understanding what they have and bringing the value of that data up so that it's in a, a usable fashion and form for uh, customers to, to really benefit from and bringing that value to them through, through a sales organization. So, okay, good. So, I mean, the three disruptors we've talked about so far are Lowe's, Amazon, slash Amazon business and Home Depot, all of which to some degree are moving into multifamily. Yep. Lowe's, you know, Home Depot most aggressively, Lowe's second, Amazon business just as part of this huge assortment and market they're pursuing, which is, you know, it's, it's all on the carpet MRO as we like to say, right? It's not, not industrial. Um, but I mean, you know, you don't normally, as a CEO of a competitor, you don't wake up and go, oh, good. Home Depot, Lowe's, and Amazon are moving into my industry, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, they're going to have an impact. They're going to scoop up their money. And yet you remain optimistic about the ability to compete, which, you know, historically, a lot of times those companies don't succeed. I mean, Home Depot was in this market once and pulled out, right? So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. And it's a gigantic market. So it's not like everyone's going to get closed out. But what's your calculus? I mean, strategically, how do you think through oh, okay, uh, you know, what's the model for saying, I'm going to try to anticipate what they're going to do and then position within the context of their actions and capabilities. How do you, as a CEO of a competitor who's actually doing great anyway, how do you think through the countermeasures to their actions? Yeah, so some of them are, are native to the industry. Uh, the, the analogy there is that uh, this industry has, uh, has well, Historically, uh, they've always thought to have at least two suppliers in the MRO supplier space. Uh, the nature of a multifamily property has a, a high level of expectance uh, from the residents, right? So uh, this is someone's home. It's typically 200 to 400 people's homes that one maintenance team is responsible for and maintaining. And people, uh, they, they can't take a shower if the, if the faucet doesn't work. So. Um, the criticalness of their uh, service requests and the service requirements drives a really tight supply chain to the suppliers. Um, we, you know, we're the only competitor uh, that in all markets that we serve that we do twice a day delivery because mm -hmm. we think that the criticality of that uh, availability of product is really important to our customers. Uh, we know that the resources are thin, right? Organizations historically had at least 50%, but sometimes two to three times as much maintenance staff 10 to 20 years ago, uh, just don't anymore. So the resources are lean. Uh, inventory is almost non-existent at a property. This is not like any commercial property that you or I may have served when we were at HD or when we were at Granger, right? Where there's a storeroom of critical spares and plenty yeah. of standard stock MRO items. We don't have the space in this industry. So the supplier community really is the, uh, is the storeroom. So right. Those types of challenges drive the need to be uh, very uh, intimate and responsive um, to the customer environment. And, and I think that as, as I look at what Home Depot and Lowe's will be doing um, as it relates to the multifamily industry, specifically the consolidation of Home Depot and HD supply um, will take uh, you know, 20, you know, 40 percent of the customers that were using one of those two suppliers as their primary or their secondary are now have a, an exclusive option with HD supply or the, the new HD pro, right? The, the challenge- they're gonna, be, they're gonna be looking for another alternative. For another they, alternative. They, want, they want two deals. They want a primary supplier and a secondary supplier. Yeah. And, now and, they, and, and a lot of them went from two to one just now. You got it. 
Right. A lot of them went from two to one just now. And on a national scale, the only other supplier is yet another retailer. And right. that retailer, Lowe's, their maintenance supply headquarters is, is a very good competitor. I mean, the, the roots of that business were, were you know, a, a tough competitor. Uh, the original century management team that built the maintenance by headquarters business, but they're, they're nominally national in scale and they're still owned by another retailer. So the argument, at least in the markets that we serve, because we're not on a national scale yet, is that you'd be better served by having at the very least your backup supplier be a multifamily only focused supplier. The, the analogy for what happened in the marketplace, right? So I was involved at HD Supply when we acquired the Hughes business and I led the MRO uh, integration acquisition and integration project. And at the time we were merging roughly two $500 million companies, right? So uh, in the multifamily space. So we built the largest player in the space, a billion dollar player after you know decades of Wilmar and, uh, and Interline, Bill Green's team uh, building through acquisition, the previously largest player. Um, we, we acquired in that acquisition Century, what was the Century Supply and the Chad Supply, the Texas-based business and the Florida-based business. Um, so as we integrated a billion dollar business in 2007, by 2017, when Maintenance Supply Headquarters, so it, it enabled within two to three years, two companies to be launched uh, post non-competes, uh, the Maintenance Supply Headquarters business in Texas, former Century executives, and the Chadwell business, which was the Chad family uh, in Florida, launched shortly after that acquisition. And by 2017, uh, when Lowe's acquired Maintenance by Headquarters, it had grown to 300 million. And Chadwell, we estimate, is probably about 200 million uh, or more today. Uh, so within, within 10 years, a billion dollar acquisition enabled $500 million new competitors to enter the marketplace. Uh, driven by driven by a few things, right? Um, the market was still growing. The spend per unit has been increasing year over year over year because the quantity and the quality of products that are expected in the in the industry have increased. Therefore, the prices have increased. Um, HD supply grew. I mean, HD supply grew probably, you know, probably doubled during that period of time as well. So the market overall has provided great opportunities for. Uh, the competitors in the space. And, uh, and I anticipate the same from this merger and acquisition to be created for those of us who are still in the marketplace and um, have the ability to serve and support those customers who are looking for something different, looking for a backup supplier, uh, don't want all their eggs in one basket. Okay, good, good answer. So, um, and I wanna encourage people to put in their questions, cl click on the Q&A button if you have anything to ask Darren. Um, so within your own organization, I assume that some of these companies, you don't have to name names, have tried to recruit some of your employees before, you know, salespeople or whatever. Um, and whether or not they have, what do you say to the team that makes them want to work for you and not go for these big guys? You know, what do you say to them and what do you offer them that's attractive versus working for one of these mega companies? So <laughs> I appreciate the question. For my team that may be listening to this, I love you guys. Love the team that we're building. Don't leave to my competitor. <laughs> uh, on the flip side, uh, my team also knows that we've recruited a, a, a significant number of competitor talent this year to ACP. And the reason is we all know what's possible. We all know that these acquisitions create opportunity for us in the marketplace. And we know customers want better. They want someone who is dedicated and focused on their business. The multifamily business will be less than 3% of Home Depot's total sales post acquisition. As big and bad, mean and tough as HD Supply is as a competitor, they're still now only in the multifamily, three to 5% of Home Depot's business. We suffered that challenge when we were part of Home Depot before. We were around a year for Home Depot. And we will impress upon our customers, impress upon our sales team, on our team that, that I'm recruiting and building and, and really proud of, that we can do better. We can do better than all of our competitors. And in doing that, we'll gain share. I will say this. I don't, you know, there have been a couple of times in my career when I've been part of a very small business unit within a very large company and you don't get the attention and you fight harder for the resources. And I don't, I'm not saying that's true at Home Depot or for Home Depot Pro, but I do think that that is a risk that you don't face when you're part of the core business at a company like AZP. Now we have a couple of questions that have come in. Kevin wants to know, do you see an opportunity for distributors like AZ 
leaning in to help property managers by providing some level of technical support or capability to them? Yeah, great question. Uh, one of the strategic initiatives that we have, and I won't go into too much detail on it, but uh, deeper intimacy with technology uh, for our customers is gonna be one of the critical paths for us. Um, we, we think of ourselves as tightly integrated to this marketplace uh, in a way that building services, solutions, and technology capabilities are going to be the way we win, not just uh, on a local level, but on the corporate accounts and the national agreements. Now, one of the things I didn't mention, right? So this industry, 25% uh, of the market is managed by the top, 20, top 50 um, operators, property management companies. But the remaining 75% of the market is typically owned and operated by anything from small family funds to uh, individual investors. And those companies, uh, they, they feel like they're small to medium sized family owned businesses like us. And there's an affinity there to do business with companies that are more like them than doing business with uh, kind of the, the Home Depots and Lowe's of the world. So we, we feel that's a, a real advantage as well. Okay. Another question, um, it's interesting here. Does the future of the multifamily industry migrate towards a contractor-based service model versus maintenance personnel on the property? Yeah, it's a great question. There's a couple of companies that are contemplating that today. Um, there is some impressive uh, platform-based startup in the single family housing environment, which I think is truly ends up being a contractor-based uh, partnership. And, you know, you could argue a vast majority of the multifamily units are served by uh, kind of an independent contractor base as well. So okay. you know, the industry is broken up and you have, you know, ownership groups that have two, four, six, eight, 12 plex units that don't have, you know, full-time onsite staff. Um, that industry is probably largely supported by contractors today and, and is, is a big customer base for a Home Depot already. Is that proportion changing? Is it? Uh, I, I don't believe that proportion changes per se uh, dramatically, right? Uh, okay. I pulled some NMHC numbers yesterday, but I didn't kind of look to that specifically. I, in my experience in other forms of MRO is the maintenance people do the simple stuff and the contractors do the more sophisticated stuff. And, and, and you'll, see, you'll see that happening. You know, COVID, uh, one of the challenges we had from a revenue perspective in, in 2020 was that uh, not only did the units not turn and the maintenance staff was only doing emergency maintenance in unit where they had something that uh, could be outsourced to a third party instead of risking employees doing the work. They turnkeyed it to uh, say an HVAC contractor who brought the HVAC unit themselves in their labor and materials uh, agreement. So uh, we sense there's, there's certainly some of that. Um, and because the, because the resources of the teams are lean, um, they will, they will uh, utilize third party sources. Great. Okay. So here's a, a question. Uh, how do customers from HD supply not get lost in the big retail slash DIY and construction focus of Home Depot? Uh, facility management MRO is much smaller than retail DIY. We talked about this a little bit, but I mean, from the customer's perspective, you know, one of the reasons they might leave is, well, the two that we've mentioned so far is something goes wrong with the integration. The other one is people want to have contracts with two different entities and now the two may have just become one. Um, but there's also this notion that they just won't get the same level of service that they'll get lost. Is that a risk? It, it, it's a risk. I mean, candidly, the management team at HC Supply is top notch. I mean, this is such a professional organization. I think they know and understand how to manage that expectation. I don't expect to win customers because HC Supply fails. Screws them. up. Right. Got it. I, I expect to win customers because we're, we're a more focused, better service provider. Right. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, and then uh, one area of differentiation from the big disruptors is in the expertise of salespeople. Given the challenges of retention, which we touched on earlier, how do you keep your sales force a team of experts in a world where that expertise is increasingly fungible? Yeah, so um, I think the most important thing you do is, is uh, through leadership, right? So uh, I had the privilege of recruiting uh, an industry leader who grew up in, uh, in the industry. Brian Mendelson was uh, oh, yeah, Brian. part of a family-owned business in Houston, Texas in multifamily. Right. Their business was sold to Interline, uh, was uh, VP of National Accounts for Interline for a number of years and uh, is extremely knowledgeable, not just of the market and the customers and, and the way business is done here, but is a, is a good leader. So I, right. I First and foremost, leadership matters. And then secondly, is giving them the tools, the support, the guidance, and uh, 
as a mutual colleague of ours and an old boss of mine, Bill Sullivan would say, give them a little rope to run. Yeah. So let's talk about leadership for a couple minutes before we wrap up. Um, you've been in a lot of leadership positions. You faced a lot of different challenges and experienced a lot of success. Um, I'm sure you've had setbacks along the way, like all of us have. Um, so now that you're the CEO of this company, which is succeeding and facing a big challenge, and you'll, you'll have all of the normal challenges ahead of you, building the right team, retention, getting the leadership place, developing the right culture and principles. Um, and you've been there about a year now, right? Yep. So what were your three priorities coming in and not, not, not business outcomes, but in terms of what you wanted to make happen within the organization? Yeah, no, uh, appreciate it. So importantly, right, Brad Schleck um, is our CEO still, right, and, right. Uh, daily involved in the business. And uh, part of my coming in was Brad and I, you know, we joke around, we call it a dating process, right? But Brad and I probably met six or seven times over one to two day sessions to talk about the business, talk about his expectations, understand the business better so that when I could come in, I'd really have a good grounding to, to start running. Um, what I'll tell you is that I, I found a company that uh, has an exceptional culture. It's a hardworking group of people. They're loyal. They uh, are loyal to our customers as well as to our company. Um, I, I found a company that actually had the underpinnings of quality, which uh, for the size of the business was uh, a bit of a surprise to me, right? We have an amazing technology platform and suite. Uh, it's executed flawlessly. It really is a, a top-notch effort. So, so Brad built a great company before you came on to help him grow it. Yeah, it so for me, uh, the issue was that we weren't growing by sales. We, we weren't aggressive enough in uh, pursuing market opportunities, pursuing national account or corporate types of agreements and being more strategic in our approach to the business. Uh, that was number one. Uh, number two was uh, finding differentiation capabilities and knowing that our customer is multifamily because we're not looking to solve the problem for hospitality or for healthcare or for commercial. Uh, we've got to dial ourselves in very tightly to the things that move the needle for uh, asset value and NOI. And, and those things are um, measurable, re, re, uh, reportable to our customer, repeatable from customer to customer. Those were uh, big key initiatives. I, I, candidly, other initiatives that I wanted to get into, uh, COVID uh, changed our priorities. Yeah, everyone had a crisis out of the blue, right? Okay, uh, uh, one last question before we wrap up. Sure. Uh, how do you see the supply chain interruptions from Asia, lack of container availability, congestion, et cetera, uh, affecting your industry growth in 2021? Yeah, so uh, uh, still one of the most important things we're, we're wrestling with. It, it hasn't been a direct Asian uh, import challenge for us as much as it's been a two-tier. Uh, we experienced significant shortages in uh, some of our large product categories. So the appliances, hot water heaters, HVAC systems, uh, which are all branded products. When you, when you get down into some of the unbranded or the products that have... Um, have optionality, a uh, little easier to find other sources of supply to fill where, where something may not have been available, but it was really hard. Uh, and not just, not just for AZP, but across the industry, availability of appliances, HVAC and uh, hot water heaters probably hit uh, everybody this year. And uh, we're hopeful that uh, like AZP and like uh, many of our competitors, we've figured out how to operate in this COVID related world. We're seeing from them an improvement and a steadying of their supply chain. Uh, I suspect that uh, is in correlation to the China um, you know, or Asian-based sourcing uh, improving and stabilizing as well. And uh, although I don't see the timeline yet or the horizon when we're really clear of this uh, COVID, I think uh, most businesses have reached a standard operating procedure of how to manage through it. And it may take some, may take a little wind out of the sail for six months, but uh, I don't think it'll take, take the year away from us. Fantastic. Okay. Well, you know, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, just to wrap up here, um, this has been uh, Darren Rawson, who's the president of AZ Parts Master. I've got his email address up on the screen now. Uh, the next show for Wholesale Change is going to be Wednesday, January 20th at uh, noon Eastern time, 9 Pacific. 
Uh, on January 21st, Jonathan and I will be doing a webcast for the National Association of Wholesalers. It's the it's the wrap up. It's the capstone of a seven part series on technology disruption. And here in this one, we're going to review some of the key findings and talk about implications strategically for distribution companies. So I hope you'll join us then. My contact information is on the right, as well as my business partner, Jonathan's. Uh, Darren, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a fascinating discussion. Good luck to you. I hope that uh, you thrive in 2021. Uh, and uh, as always, please let us know if we can help you in any way. Uh, and I can tell you know tell tell the audience, Darren's a great guy and a great leader. Uh, and it's really been a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All right. Happy New Year, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye now.